dedicated to horror, movies, and awesomeness. This week, we continue our look at werewolf movies with Hammer Studios' entry in the genre, Oliver Reed in 1961's Curse of the Werewolf. Bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror fans who have the warning spoilers ahead. From Denver, Colorado, I'm your host, Jason Henderson, writer of the upcoming Ben 10 comic series from IDW. I say upcoming, actually, it came out this week, or it started to. With me from Austin is Drew Edwards, writer of the long-running comic Halloween Man, Coming soon now from Monsterverse Comics and contributing writer to Rockabilly Online and Monsterverse's Tales from the Grave. Say hello, Drew. Howdy. Howdy. Also in Austin, Mr. Tony Savaggio, writer of the Victorian mech comic Clockworks from Humanoids and the very Hunger Games-like manga Psycom from Right Stuff and Tokyo Pop and lead singer of the band Deserts of Mars. Say hello, Tony. Hey. Hey. And also in Denver with color commentary. As always, host of the Mom Oriented Podcast, Pod Moms, Attorney Julia Guzman. Say hello. Hello. I'll try not to cough or sneeze at you guys since I have this cold, head cold. <laughs> the curse of the head cold. She has, <laughs> yes. Yes. She has, she has dragged herself <laughs> out of her crypt and onto the phone, and she's going to be coughing at us all night. Okay. The curse of the werewolf. Uh, this is such a special thing for me because this is a Hammer movie, and I always love to talk Hammer movies. And But this is a Hammer movie I had never seen before, except I think maybe glimpses when I was a kid. The Curse of the Werewolf, 1961, is a British film based on the novel The Werewolf of Paris by Guy Endor. The film was made by the British film studio Hammer Film Productions, was shot at Bray Studios. The leading role of the werewolf was Oliver Reed's first credited film appearance. Um, and he's fantastic. So, first impressions and... For no particular reason, let's uh, uh, put Julia out of her misery first. Ju- we'll go Julia, Tony, Drew, and then I'll go. So, Julia, um, lay it on us. First impressions, Curse of the Werewolf. Well, I think this is kind of a dumb movie. <laughs> I really love it. Um, I don't like that it's like 15 different movies in one. I mean, it just starts over and over and over. It's like they decided to make it this epic picture of several generations of people but except it's very short so it kind of just i don't know it's i guess it's more like an anthology of short stories really but um i don't know i thought it was silly i thought it was really ridiculous that it supposedly takes place in spain when when everybody's british and wearing like dark makeup which is just irritating because spaniards aren't even that dark anyway and it's stupid and (laughs) they um and there's no reason for it to be in spain i mean except for the fact that they had built the sets for some other movies that they decided to use it, but it takes place in London. And it's all British actors, and it's based on a movie that takes place in Paris. I mean, a book. Uh, what is it? A movie that takes place in Paris? It is um, a British a movie. Book. Yeah, it's a yeah. British movie about a Spanish werewolf based on an American novel about a. That French takes place werewolf. in Paris, right? Yeah. Right. So yeah, so the whole that that just bothered me, and but anyway, so that's kind of my. I'm sort of a thumbs down. On this so thumbs down from Julia. Um, all right. <laughs> Tony, Curse of the Werewolf, first impressions? I actually liked it all right. I, I um I actually enjoyed it, but it is like a bunch of different things. I think what I actually what I enjoyed was maybe what Julia didn't like and I thought it was like a werewolf origin story from like, you know, over time. And I thought yeah. that actually was kinda cool. Despite the fact how everything happens. I mean, there's some pretty dis dis uh, distasteful things going on. Uh, but yeah. I thought, you know, like the tragedy, I think it's cool how they kind of start with this, the makeup as the like thing that goes under the titles, um, the yes. for credits and like, you know, it even like lays on a tear like, oh, this is, you know, pathos, werewolf pathos you're going to see. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not a big fan of the final makeup. Ah. And I have a few other things that I, you know, didn't like, but we'll get into that. But like, I, I thought it was, I thought it was a decent werewolf flick, and I, like I said, I, I kind of liked that it was, you know, this multi generational kind of uh, yeah. origin story. Wow. All right. So that's one down and one up. Drew, what are your first impressions? Curse of the werewolf. Um, I, I 
didn't, as I was saying before we started this, I didn't see this movie, uh, unlike a lot of uh, the, the quote-unquote classic horror films, I didn't see this until I was a teenager. And uh, again, like most of the Hammer films, it was a little bit more difficult to get a hold of them than, than the universal horror films. Um, I really like this movie. I do find the opening bit with the the marquee and the beggar and that whole thing, I do find that really kind of difficult to watch because it is so sad and so upsetting. And, and yet, you know, it does add this extra layer yeah. of, of tragedy and everything. Plus there's that whole element of, of class warfare going yeah. on, but it's, it's an extremely folkloric take on the where, you know, the werewolf mythology. In fact, a lot of it is actually taken you know, the, the the idea that you can become a werewolf because your father was a rapist or the idea you can become a werewolf because you were born on Christmas. Both of those ideas are actually based off of real of Eastern European out of, folklore. Out of wedlock child born on Christmas. Yeah. You know, and uh, I have to disagree very strongly with Tony about the makeup. This is one of the coolest looking werewolves in the history of film. I love <laughs> this werewolf. Like, it's actually I made a, a blog post earlier this week and it's it's in my top five. That's a badass looking werewolf. And Oliver Reed, Oliver Reed is great uh, as the werewolf, and I love the fact that you can see him, you know, th- even though he's so thoroughly made up, you can still see, you know, Oliver Reed under all of that. It just enhances the whole thing to me. Absolutely. So uh, I, I, what what everybody's been referring to, and this is and this is my my uh, opening thoughts, um, and I guess I guess we'll get into it after after I say this. So I want to explain what's going on with the generational stuff. I loved this movie. I loved how how just incredibly, just thoroughly sad it is. You know how the whole point of the movie seems to be that you cannot escape fate. Fate will keep coming for you. Fate has no pity. Bad things happen to good people. <laughs> you know, it's it's just relentlessly downbeat. This movie is, you know, every last moment of hope is always dashed. There, <laughs> and, um, it's and so uh, it it's so thoroughly dark in that way, and yet so beautifully lit, so so sort of bright and beautiful in that Technicolor way that that Hammer movies are. I love this thing. You know, this, this, I I. I really enjoyed it. It's true, as Julia pointed out, it's very, very short and it has more generations than a James Michener novel. It is an extremely just over, overwritten and yet strangely fast-moving film. So um, let's get into it. So first, the, the, the deal of this movie, the, the structure of it, is that we start with a prologue that takes up, all, honestly, almost half the movie. We start with a, uh, a beggar, who is moving through Spain. And um, do you guys know the story of why this film takes place in Spain? Like, like what's it's going be- on? With- it's because uh, Hammer had built Spanish sets for another movie, and they had the rights to do a film of Werewolf to Paris, but, uh, you know, there's a cost-saving thing. They moved it from, from France to, to Spain. Right. The movie actually was called something like, I think, The Rape of Sabana. I have no idea if it was a historical picture or a, some sort of weird bodice ripper or whatever. But anyway, at the time, Hammer was in the habit of, uh, having or Hammer was required to submit any of its scripts to uh, the public censors before they even started shooting. I mean, this is, it's, it's very strange to imagine a regime like that, but that's the kind of regime they had. Uh, in the 60s in Great Britain, and I know it's a regime we have like that in the past in the United States as well. So several people got a look at it and could comment on it. Censors could say, you can do this, you can't do this to earn such and such a rating, fine. But also the Catholic Church took a look at it. They didn't like the content of, of that picture. And so they said, you know, we're going to put out a bunch of comments publicly and say we don't like this movie and tell people not to watch it. Hammer got cold feet because they were like, well, you know, we can't afford to alienate all the Catholics in Britain. And so they decided to scrap that movie, but they'd already built these enormous Spanish sets that, you know, look, I, admittedly, I actually think that they, it would have been fine for them to say, and look, this is 17th century Paris. I, I don't think it would have been a problem to pretend that the sets were France, but they do look 
I guess, Spanish. And so they were like, well... Or just have them be British. I mean, why can't it just be British? Why does well, have to because be those sort of plazas with the fountain and, the, and all the... It does look... It looks way more Pirates of the Caribbean than it does... You know anything British? Don't you think? Well, and the thing, the thing about the accents, I mean, the the thing about the accents, I mean, that's not something that Hammer is just guilty of. I mean, they're still doing that. I mean, Valkyrie came out a few years ago, and everybody in that movie about Nazi Germany is either English or American. Well, that's, and, that's you know, just the, the way it's done. You know, that, yeah, that's right. just, that's a movie trope. I'm just saying there was no reason. Well, the reason is the set, like you said. That's and that's a stupid reason. <laughs> there's, a, there's another. I mean, there's another way that you can do these things. I mean, for instance, they just did a an American remake of uh, the girl with the dragon tattoo, right? And so everybody's in Sweden, and so if you watch the Swedish version, everybody just speaks Swedish. I don't believe there is a dubbed version. If there is, I haven't seen it. In the American version. In, it takes place in Sweden, fine. A bunch of American actors, fine. But what's strange is that all the American actors do Swedish accents. Mm-hmm. I don't know whose cockamamie idea that was, but it's so absurd to have Christopher Plummer, who's Canadian, doing a Swedish accent. That was crazy. But, you know, whatever. And some do more of an accent and some do less of an accent. Daniel Craig, who's James Bond, can't be bothered to do a Swedish accent. So that's nuts. That, you know, so I'm glad they didn't do that with everybody like pretending to do a, you know, a, a, a Spanish accent here. Um, anyway, this movie starts out with, uh, and we'll go through this pretty quickly because we don't want to like belabor it too much. But, but it sets the whole tone of the film. Uh, beggar moving through Spain stops in this one town where the local uh, aristocrat who kind of rules the town, the Marquess. Uh, is getting married, and so he makes his way up to the castle, and the Marquess is incredibly cruel to him, you know, makes him dance. He buys, Man, he buys him for his wife. He jerks. buys him for his new bride. Right. What's that, Tony? <sighs> the nobles are such jerks. <laughs> I mean, yes. I guess I guess we're well, letting believe there's... that most of the time they were, but, man, just. Well, the bad nobles. <sighs> we're going to get to a good aristocrat. In a bit. But there, there, there are people that actually have a who actually believe that this is a, a pro-communist film because of mm-hmm. this underlying. Like I think that's hogwash. Right. But, uh, I mean, I can see but, where they they could think that. I, don't, I mean, I don't think it really is, but you know, I, I, yeah, I don't, it's not stretch it, I guess. But there's a class yeah. thing going on, but. But I think it's not. I don't really think. Honestly, I believe that those guys are just scared of the Marquettes. I think the Marquess is the mean one. And I think the other guys are just going along because he'll like he goes over and starts hitting the table laughing, and then they're all like, "Oh yeah, we're laughing now, ha 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 ha." That's funny. But I really don't think that they're all bad. I think they are kind of mortified by the whole thing when he's making the beggar dance and all that. I think that it's they're afraid of it. This is very, at this point. This is very Edgar Allan Poe, by the yeah. way. Yeah. You know this whole yeah. You have the one you know super corrupt noble and a bunch of like weaklings who are not going to stand up to him. But I thought the Marquesa was a really weird choice for casting as well. She just seemed very, like, kind of American. Well, I mean, look, it's a role that know. only lasts for, like, for like 90 seconds. So, basically, the, the, the beggar, in rapid succession, here's what happens. The beggar insults the Marquess or whatever. For, anyway, for, very, for reasons that make no sense, um, not complaining, just saying that's how it goes down. Marquess is cruel. He throws the beggar in prison. The beggar is... The beggar spends the next, like, 20 years in prison being fed by a beautiful little mute girl who grows up into a voluptuous adult mute girl who, when she is attacked by the Marquez, who has become a leprous, scaly old man, she gets thrown into prison, whereupon she is raped by the beggar who has and, gone mad. And he, presumably, at some point he was supposed to be a werewolf, which makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. If if he's a werewolf and then he rapes her, and then she it's, it's will not eventually that he's become a, pregnant. He's a werewolf. It's that he's he's become beast-like. He's no, not no, like no, a no, 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 but, no. But he actually he actually was supposed to be a werewolf, according to the IMDb in, trivia. In a draft, anyway. uh, yeah, and it, in an interview, it said Richard Wordsworth said that that the original screen screenplay, the beggar character, was a werewolf. 
But Hammer told him that the censor had problems with that because of him being a rapist. They didn't like the idea of a werewolf rapist. <laughs> well, <laughs> so they cut well, that out. Werewolf rapists are okay. <laughs> werewolf, yes. throw that in there. Oof. That would be both. problems. I think that's hilarious, hilarious and strange. I think yeah. because it smacks a beastie out. You know what? I'm not even going to guess what the hell the censors were thinking. The point is, now it's just turned into a super dark soap opera. Because now, we were already in like generation two now. And... You know, the girl grows up and she's betrayed by this man that she's fed because he's gone insane. He rapes her. She gets pregnant. Then she breaks out. She murders the Marquess. There's not, there's no real time for the movie to deal with all this, but now she's a murderer on the run. And then she escapes, whereupon she is sort of saved from drowning. And the beggar dies. Yeah, the the beggar dies of... Of whatever. Of, of being of, a heart attack, probably. I'm of no longer being needed by the movie, really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. So he's gone. And that happens again because she gets picked up by um, the very, very, by the good aristocrat. We just saw the bad aristocrat. Now we see the good one, which is um, uh, Don Alfredo. Don Alfredo picks up the, the mute girl, brings her back where his servant, Teresa, uh, decides I'm going to spend the next, you know, you know I'm going to take care of this girl. We, we've got a, we've got a girl. The girl's pregnant. We're going to have a baby in the house. Everybody's happy. And at this point, you go, wow. Well, this movie could work out pretty well. And it's also like now, like halfway into the movie, and you're like, there's nothing happening remotely horror in this movie yet, other than the horror of people being just really mean to one another. Which is one of the reasons why I don't like this movie so much. I'm like, way, way too much time is just spent on all this. Well, I mean, it just depends. I mean, it. it at, Honestly, up to this point, it's essentially, it's a costume drama. I mean, that's what it is. Yeah. You know, it's 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 uh, it's just it's like a room with a view or any one of those movies where you know people are, it's or dangerous liaisons or anything like that. <clears throat> so um, let's see. Where does the oh yeah well so mute girl finally uh, is jettisoned by the script when she dies in childbirth, and little Leon is born. On Christmas Day. Yes. Okay. When do they first, can somebody remind, when do they first intimate that there's something wrong with this kid being born on Christmas well, Day? Well, no, the, the, when the baby's born, um, somebody says it's an insult to heaven that he's oh, yeah, born on priest. Christmas Day. The priest, yeah. And then uh, they, uh, when they baptize this baby, the water starts shaking and this gargoyle reflection oh, yeah. happens in the water and there's thunder and um, in the, they're speaking Latin, but the the captions say speaking Spanish, which made me laugh. Um, and uh, and then like there's just well yeah that's that's the basic thing. It's it's an insult to heaven to have a baby out of wedlock on Christmas because I guess only Jesus is allowed to be born on Christmas to a. I have never heard that that. Although she that, was married, I guess. I've never heard that folk folk <laughs> wisdom. I don't know if it's real. I wouldn't be at all surprised. I mean, you know, I I got no. I, I have no reason to doubt that there would be people who would say that a child born out of wedlock on Christmas Day is bad luck. I got that just that sounds equally crazy with a million other things that people believe. So you know, the seventh son of a seventh son was also supposed to become either a werewolf or a vampire, uh, depending. Um, Anyway, so now at about the halfway point, the horror stuff starts kicking in. We could have done, and 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 you got to think. By the way, none of this is following modern screenplay methodology. Whereas in, in a modern screenplay, you kind of set up everything like in the first five minutes and then your main character comes on and has a normal life for the first 20 minutes after that and then something bad happens and he turns into a werewolf there at like the 30 minute mark and so forth. This isn't doing any of that stuff. This is taking the weirdest, the weirdest format yeah, and maybe maybe at this point they hadn't invented that paradigm. Yet. Well, I think I think uh, older movies do have a tendency to not. I mean, if this was a modern horror film, they would have shown you a werewolf in like the first minute or two, just because you know you're paid to see werewolves. I figure you want to see that. Right. <laughs> you know. The, the, no, that's precisely the, right. This yeah. is this yeah. is a very char- this is a very character driven movie, which is one of the reasons I do like it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So about this point, um, uh, somebody starts killing the the uh, some someone or something starts killing the uh, the goats that are being you know herded 
in the village. And uh, we meet a couple of characters that are going to keep going on. Pepe is the sort of the guy who is in charge of getting rid of the varmints that, that kill goats. And that's the, that seems to be the local economy is, is goat herding. And Pepe is suffering greatly because something that, that he can't seem to catch or kill is killing the goats. And we come to learn that that something is the little boy, Leon, who has a little boy is going out at night and turning into a werewolf. A little boy looks just like Michael Banks from, the, from Mary Poppins. Yes. Right. <laughs> I wish it were brown makeup on. <laughs> it's not quite him, but it, it's very similar to him. This, this plummy little British boy is going out at night and killing goats, off screen, of course. So Pepe is suffering because he can't get any respect because people are like, why aren't you killing the goats? So once again, the curse is making people's lives miserable in this movie. Well, and it's so creepy for the little kid because the little kid actually tells his uncle, Alfredo, his, well, he calls him his uncle Alfredo, his, you know, the adopted dad, basically, that he um, that he's upset because he's had these, these dreams that he's a wolf and that he <clears throat> tasted the blood of a squirrel and really liked it. Oh, boy, that and was He has creepy. hair on his hand and his arms, and it's just all this awful stuff, and I'm just like, poor thing, this is just a terrible thing for this kid to be going through. <clears throat> so for whatever reason, this priest knows all about this stuff and um, tells him that he inherited weakness, uh, but he didn't tell him, he tells the, Alfredo, that the kid inherited weakness, which has allowed um, p- him to be possessed by an animal spirit, and that it's an accident of birth, but love will cure him, so he mm. just needs to be to be loved and all this. And so it's, it's really strange how this priest happens to know all this um, stuff yes, about werewolves. Yes, I think the, the love as a cure thing is kind of an interesting, mm-hmm. like, yes, you can do yeah, like, a whole bunch with that too. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, and you become a werewolf, you know, we saw a movie, we saw Wolfman just a, a, a couple of movies ago. With that one, you become a wolf um, by being bit by a wolf. Mm-hmm. And in this one, you become a wolf because God it's has a said so. Yeah, it's a curse. Yeah, and then um, you become not a wolf because because love changes you. It's astonishing. I mean, it's completely spiritual, this being a wolf, you know? Well, it's, it's um, also this idea that, uh, you know, through our... our family and loved ones that we, we, we become our better selves. You know, I think that yeah. that works very well on a, me- oh, yeah, I like on, that. A, on a metaphorical level. Yeah. Thank no, you. I like that. How deep of you, Drew? <laughs> That's very deep. I have my moments. No, I like, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm with Drew. I think that part, like, I'm like, That's kind of cool. Um, you know, we don't get to see much of that, but I think that that is, you know, I think that's one of the, Think that makes it interesting and kind of different from a lot of well, other. Well, I like all the movies. thinking that's going in here. You know, <laughs> that the, the, the script. You know, the fact that the script is taking time to show us that because Leon is a werewolf, even though it's not fair, um, he is killing goats, and that's not fair to the people who keep goats. He can't be killed because we don't want to see him killed. But of course, that's not fair to Pepe, the one who's supposed to to take care of the goats. You know, basically, everything is just not fair. It's just a tremendously unlucky world that these guys are in, you know. And, uh, and yeah, and love can transform it, which is, which is astonishing. Um, so, anyway, and in fact, love transforms him now because Teresa, you know, uh, takes care of the boy, and it says that after a couple of these events when he's a kid – he grows up to be a strapping young Oliver Reed, and he never has another incident. But we do see what we do see before that, though. We do see him in uh, as a as a boy turning into the werewolf. Like he's got these vampire teeth at one point, and it does, the uncle has put up bars on the window yeah. to prevent him from going out and doing any more killing because he's afraid for him, I guess. So, um, so that was interesting because you see the little boy kind of turning into almost like a it looks more like a vampire than a Werewolf, yeah. and then uh, but then yeah then he then we have the transformation into a teen or a young man. Yeah, he becomes he becomes Oliver Reed wearing this really kind of awesome um, period costume, you know, with the long coat. He looks like Tom Jones, uh, you know, it, like Albert Finney and Tom Jones. You know, it, when I was watching it, it's funny that Benicio del Toro played you know werewolf in the new remake because I think he would have played this role like 
You yeah. could swap out Oliver Reed and him. Like it would have worked. He would have. He would play an awesome remake of this. I think. You yes. Know? yes. Uh, well, I think. Uh, I mean, we're, we'll get around to doing that, but uh, that movie. But you know, I, I do think they they certainly co-opted elements of this movie for that remake. Yeah. Like, as well as for a couple other classic uh, classic werewolf flicks. This guy is much more. He's got his stuff together a lot better, honestly, than Larry Talbot did. You know, they're both people who have grown up in a manor. You know, it's almost impossible to imagine that this character has any memory before he grew up in a manor with servants, with all the money in the world. You know, and now he's dashing and, and he's going to run off to the big city, you know, with the blessing of, of course, his father and, and Teresa, the mother figure in his life. And, you know, and he's going to make his way and work in a job. But although we know darn well that he doesn't need this job, you know, he's got all the money he's ever going to need. So he's going off to work in a, you know, in a, a bottling plant, actually sort of a bottling stable, just because, because he wants to get that experience. So there's nothing we don't like about this guy. He's awesome. Oh, what do you guys think of Oliver Reed himself? I mean, he's, he's really, uh, you know, to answer my own question, I thought he was a really arresting figure. Yeah, he's cute. Hot. <laughs> He's got yeah, those he's, blue he's, eyes. He's he's got a nice intensity to him. He's probably, you know, you 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 don't have to think very hard to think that there might be an animal, yeah. uh, you know, lurking underneath. You know, the, the, it, he's got sort of a, a nice uh, Russell Crowe werewolf vibe going on. <laughs> yes, he has a snarl kind of look to him all the time. Um, you know, he's very lean. You know, when there's a point where he's shirtless and he's like, you know, he's so lean that his like, you know, all of his muscles ripple and everything. I mean, he's, you know, this is not the older, fatter, drunk Oliver Reed that we all came to know and love. This is this is a totally different Oliver Reed. Um, and uh, yeah, he's 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 really arresting. And um, and it also means that when he has to wear all that makeup, he looks great. He's in perfect shape, so he'll look good as a werewolf when it happens. Anyway, so far, everything's going great. He hasn't had any werewolf incidents. Um, and he, you know, starts his new job and he immediately falls in love with a beautiful and sweet girl who is, <laughs> is betrothed to, I don't know, Percy San Sebastian. The <laughs> I think she looks like a chip. I think she looks like a chip at like one of the female chipmunks. Yes. Her name is Christina <laughs> and she has great big, you know, chipmunk cheeks and an adorable overbite and a teeny little nose. I mean, she's just like, you know, sweet London girl wearing a lot of powder to make her a little bit darker. And, um, yeah, uh, and her, <laughs> her boyfriend, they, they go out of their way to make the guy that she's going to marry literally the most absurd character. Slavish. Yeah, oh, oh, God, every line. Oh, Rico, been, right? Isn't that... <laughs> The guy. I think it's oh, Rico. Man. He's yeah. like, I say, drive on. <laughs> at one point, at one point, at one point, he goes, he goes. Uh, she says something like, I need to borrow, I need to take your carriage. And he goes, What's that? And Jason goes, It's a, it's a, um, a thing with wheels on it that's pulled by horses. But that's not important right now. <laughs> no, but, but he's like, Yeah, he's always oh, it's beastly inconvenient. Oh, oh man. <laughs> and, you, and, and you you know, you wonder why she's like, <laughs> well, not really, but she's like lukewarm about it. She's like, well, yeah, you know, my father hooked us up. I guess he's rich and stuff. And then you're like, really, woman? This is what you get for the rest of your life. Oh. <laughs> you're like, no, don't do it. Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah. What a, what a wonderful well, they kind of have to do that. They kind of have to do that. Otherwise, you know, like, because she's, che- she's cheating on her yeah. fiancé with all of her sure, sure, they sure. made It made him too likable. You wouldn't like her. Well, right. Well, Absolutely. In, yeah, at, the hands of, at the hands of, you yeah. know, you could, you could write this so that, you know, there's just something. You could even write it so that Oliver Reed has animal magnetism. Yes. You know, but uh-huh. instead they instead they just make well, it. Well, of course, like, I, I anybody, think though the way we should any, read Julia's reaction, he kind of does. Yes, yeah, there you go. Yeah. But but instead we just you know, because it's always it's I don't know. You watch enough movies, it's kind of co- a cop out whenever the bad you know the 
guy you're not supposed to want the girl to be with is just is a is a Rico. <laughs> you're yeah. like, wow, yeah, one, please man. don't ever go with him to anything or <laughs> stay with him. But, well, and know, in a longer movie, you know, and we've seen this probably in a lot of movies, in a longer movie or a movie that chose to spend all basically all hundred minutes or so with Oliver Reed, you would have had a much longer business of of you know, the horrible fiance, maybe he's beaten on her, maybe he's sleeping with hookers, who knows? You know, and and so in this one he's just Rico. Yeah, and this one just the reason annoying. Is. That's enough. We have got to move on. <laughs> we because understand. they are immediately in the next scene having this sneak around affair. And then, uh because it's his first week and a heck of a week it's been, uh he goes out partying with his really awesome um comic relief coworker. I disagree that he's awesome. I think he was really annoying. I thought he was really annoying. <laughs> really annoying character. He has a coworker who is this big and beefy, you know, sort of stringy haired, awesome, you know, coworker slash roommate who is jovial and, and you know, is like, Hey, it's Saturday, it's your first week, we're gonna hit the town. I think I'm he's like drunky the drunk guy. He's just like Yeah. <laughs> he's about getting the He's about getting the chicks. He must be rich, too, because you don't, like, when you look at it, you're not like, yeah, man, Babe Magnet, this guy. <laughs> He's got it going. <clears throat> well, I but, mean, this but is, he a, is, evidently, this is a house you know? of loose morals that they're visiting. Right. I mean, they're, they're going to this brothel, basically. Um, they never say the word brothel. I'm not sure they ever say the word prostitute. Well, I um, get the impression it's just, like, the kind of standard bar that happens to have a lot of bluesies there, you know. Yeah. Like, no, it seems like a brothel because she has a room upstairs. That's that's my yeah, one. Yeah, I, I, I always have been under the impression that this is a brothel. Well, I I guess maybe I'm thinking like brothel in the same way. Uh, lots of saloons were also brothels. You know what I mean? I guess that's true. Like you I would go there, can, and it could be a bar, or guess who's here? You know what I mean? Like yes, yeah, no. Rather than point. just go to a brothel, like it's not. It doesn't seem like that, which is a totally different thing. It's a well, bar the question is, the same way that it's you can go into anyway, this place and matter. you can go into this place and have some drinks and then leave. So it's a brothel where I guess it's also you're right. It's a working saloon. So yeah, because most brothels that you see in the movies don't have dancing, except for like the Bessel Warehouse in Texas. There's not usually dancing going on. <laughs> if I could figure out a way for us to do the Bessel Warehouse in Texas, we would totally <laughs> do that, Marty. Um So yeah. I just think you need to do a, a second podcast. It's just movies <laughs> yes. at this point. Just for movies. Just, just movies. for other kinds of movies. We have all that time. All this time. Stuff, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Stuff Jason wants to talk about. <laughs> uh, all right. So anyway, um, he's at the brothel, and now the movie kicks into high gear because really there's not much left of this movie, and it's all going to have werewolves in it because he um, he gets together with this one very, very blonde, very, very British, very 1960s uh, floozy white girl prostitute who just really seems to have walked in from a Jack the Ripper movie, honestly. But she's, you know, he attacks her. She's dead. That was grisly. I mean, they show her body, and she's got these giant slashes on her neck and and, um, shoulders. And I thought that was... Really, some amazing makeup. I mean, I was I was kind of astonished by by the ripped flesh stuff. <clears throat> and then, um, uh, let's see. He kills he kills well he kills his roommate. So that's done. And then it's um he goes home. Uh, like a you know a freshman in college going home to do his laundry. He goes home and you know he sleeps it off there. And I I I don't want to spend too much time getting to basically we're going to go through a lot of plot that really amounts to he at first he winds up in prison because they know that he's the one who did the killings but he's convinced that if they don't ship him off somewhere or kill him he's going to turn back into a werewolf and move away he does have a brief moment where he thinks uh, if i if if i run away with christina her goodness will save me um but that's well, that's because there's out. one point where the moon rises and he's with her and he doesn't change. Yes, that's right. That's right. So, you know, they uh, he he realizes quickly, though, that that 
that may not work out because he can't get out of jail. Um, she's not aware that he's a werewolf. Nobody's going to believe that anyway, other than um, Don Alfredo the priest, and the priest. The priest. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, but, I love the scene where they, they bring in sort of the, the mayor of the town, and he, he, he makes him show him his hands and teeth. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because the mayor wants to go visit this prisoner in the prison and see if, in fact, this is a werewolf that I need to ship off somewhere, mm-hmm. or he can just stay here and wait for his trial like everybody else. And he says, show me your hands and teeth, which, of course, you know, I mean, it's just the hands and teeth of Oliver Reed, who has some fantastic teeth. I mean, they're huge. I, I wonder if... In another real... movie, I wonder if they would have just had him, like, bite the guy's hands off. <laughs> you know, like, oh God! <laughs> that would um, be insane. Yeah. So it, it's basically it's a short time before you know he's stuck in the prison, which means of course when the when the moon comes up, he breaks right out. Because well, was, and and he does have now he does have, spend a night. Is that the one he spends with the girl? That was the night before. That okay. was what Drew. Yeah, he before. does. Yeah, right, right, right. So he spends the night with the girl, and he doesn't change because of her love. So now he's in this prison. So then he breaks. But then, um, so when does he kill his the prison the guy in, in the jail with him? Well, that's right. That's that night. I yeah. mean, he knows the 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 moon is going to change him. He's stuck in the jail. Right. And so the moment, you know, he turns into werewolf, he kills the drunk guy, Drinky the drunk guy in the in the jail cell. Who is, by the way, Drew? Did you recognize the drunk guy? That is that is Michael Michael Ripper, right? Yes, that's Michael Ripper, who will appear as this guy. In like many many horror uh, Hammer movies, <laughs> he'll be who has drunk, an awesome name, bartender sometimes. Yes. Yeah, fantastic name. He is wonderful. I mean, that guy just shows up over and over again in the Hammer movies. Here he is called uh, something like the old. What was it? The old sop or something? I can't remember. Old soak. The old soak. The old soak. Yes. yes, meaning the old drunk guy. Yes. And. Um, so, you know, Michael Ripper is killed very quickly. <laughs> and then he breaks out, he kills the the guard, and then he heads into town to, to kill yet more people. And this is an the the final what okay, so talk to me about the makeup, because now here's where we finally get the makeup. Who wants to take it on? I I you know well, before I, you start I, about, I, Wait, before you start talking about the makeup, I just want to say how much how irritating it is to me that he rips his shirt in the thing. He rips it up in one way, and then in, later on in the movie, suddenly his shirt is tucked. He's tucked in his shirt, <laughs> like as a werewolf. Well, he's tucked know, it in and torn it more neatly. I mean, he's gonna he's gonna have to see a lot of people. So it's not, it's, <laughs> I don't know. I I go, go, lay it on us, Drew. Tell us but about yes, this makeup about and makeup. how it happens. I really like this makeup. I think you know it, it, it's. It's it's along the same lines of the Wolfman, but you you can obviously see where makeup effects had advanced over the years. And honestly, out of the Hammer makeups, I think this is the the best Hammer monster makeup that they ever did. I mean, you, you can see his full chest, which is all furry. He's got these great claws. He's got these big pointy ears on his head, and then this this beast type face sticking out in the center. But then again, it's so very clearly still. Oliver Reed, which makes it yeah. that much more creepy to me. You know, like I love werewolf movies where they go further than this to a point, but I I never think they're as scary because I just think when you can still kind of see the man inside this creature, yeah. it makes it a little bit more disturbing. It, it, it's so very obviously got the, the the layer of Oliver Reed under there. Yeah, and just and he's great as the werewolf. He's doing all kinds of athletic athletic things that. You know, you never really got to see, uh, you know, the Wolfman do, and it's it's I don't know. This is a really cool werewolf. Like I, I love this werewolf. He's got he's, he's got a full chest. He's got a full back. You know, yeah. it's a full upper body prosthesis. Yeah, um, I think most of it's cool. Something about the face just really, I don't know. There's something about the face that to me looks more like Lost in Space monster mm. than. You know, cool werewolf that I dig. And how is it done? This uh, is, is I this... like the transformation. Like I said, I like all of it up until the point where you see him running around and the face. Like I like the ears. Like there's parts of it I like, but something about the final how it looks just 
never really has been my favorite. Uh, I, I agree, agree, to, disagree, cool agree to disagree. I know. Well, you know, I, that's, I love that's fine the geekiness. Too. I mean, the the hair, the, this this makeup, and I'm looking at a picture of it right now. It's all this very fine, sort of light brown hair, you know, that is that is all over his face and all over his body. It's you know, so you can really there's so much like texture to this to this makeup. I can't tell like how much prosthesis is like on his his forehead. You know, his his nose has is built up and he's got some he's got latex over his forehead. The rest is just you know, I don't I, I I can only assume this is this is somehow I don't know if it's a full headpiece or if it's just a wig and then lots of like fur is attached to you know, in big sideburns kind of things to his face. But it's awesome. I, I actually really liked it, but I know exactly, I know what you're talking about, Tony. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's a, it, I, it's a very memorable makeup, you know. And yeah, I mean, it's iconic. It's just, you know, and it's fine to disagree. It's just not yeah, yeah, my yeah. personal no. favorite. Like, I even though, like, you can tell, like I said, like, there's a lot of it I, that is really cool and really, like, interesting. And, you know, it probably is one of the best hammer makeup but yeah yeah no, there's something about it doesn't work i wish i could really just put my finger on it but it i don't know in some sure, ways i no, see it I, easier I, I than, than it should be and i don't i don't know well really i was bothered by I, the shirt that he wears oh, i don't i don't no it's the continuity that bothers me the fact that he tears tears it one way and then it's completely different in the next but it's just a, you know continuity error <laughs> Um, okay, so he he turns into the into this particular werewolf, and it's that werewolf that gives the uh, that gives the citizens of of the town a chase all around the town. They're shooting at him. He's he's like running and leaping over rooftops, and this whole set just looks fantastic, you know, as he's as he's escaping. I like that whole sequence. Um, and and it's exciting. I mean, you're worried about what's going to happen. Our main characters are sort of running around, getting into place, you know. And he's our the the werewolf Oliver Reed before he changed already gave us a clue as to how this is all going to go down. Because he said, "Well, go to Pepe. He was the guy who was the wolf hunter back in the day. He still got his silver bullet that he made. So go get it from him. So that if I turn into a werewolf, you can shoot me." He made it out. He made it out of his wife's. Crucifix that had been blessed by the Archbishop. Oh, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I like isn't how that... I like I, you know I actually like that sequence a lot. I like yeah. that character a lot. I love how he's like, well, if I just do this, she won't miss it <laughs> until she does. And then he's like, look, I need something. That's, to fight. How, that's what my husband is. My husband yeah. is big on on ask for ask forgiveness rather than permission. Yes. Well, <laughs> uh, hey, well that means Jason, you can get away with a uh, you know melting down a crucifix. Of course. There you go. See, your wife has done has knows enough about where like horror movies and werewolves now that she might be like, okay, well, if you think that's best, yeah. <laughs> As opposed <laughs> to his <laughs> wife, who's like, yeah. hey, why'd you melt down the crucifix? That's that was mine. He's like, well, you know, <laughs> werewolf. <laughs> and so, as he continues to polish the bullet, yeah. You know, like I like that that subplot I, continues. That there's it's a 90 minute movie. If that. You know, maybe it's a 70. I can't remember. But, the, you know, it's a very short movie, and yet we've got the whole subplot involving um, the that groundskeeper and the wife that runs the inn and the people who doubt his competence because he was never able to catch the wolf. I mean, that's that's really interesting that they're spending all this time on this sort of... Really yeah, that's why I like the origin thing. story parts, like, a lot, actually. I like, you know, for yeah. all of its flaws for me... It there was so much that I did like, although it is really weird because by the end, since we're talking about the end, it it was like all of a sudden it turns into the Hunchback. Yes, you're like just because it came from a book called A Werewolf in Paris doesn't mean there's more there's more Paris than the Hunchback. Like yes, you know this right? <laughs> like because all of a sudden it's just become that. Yeah, and it's just He's so running. weird. He's... What a weird like that part where i mean it's it's villagers and it's he's in a tower like the whole thing is like wow you just you know it's funny you else. say you say hunchback and with the thing with the villagers i always just immediately think that they were probably thinking of you know universal horror movies from yeah but from it's decades played past. out but it's played out no, you're totally com- like the hunchback you're it's not like right. it's not like 
it's not played out like Frankenstein. Yeah. It's played well, out like Frankenstein. I mean, you got angry like, villagers. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're it's right. Just, you're not yeah, wrong. <laughs> you're not yeah. wrong. It's just so weird, you know. Just the the choice because he, like the the way the setup is and everything, like it turns out to be like it made me want to go <laughs> no, watch you're right. like, it, it, the it, silent it's so funny back. If, if like if the werewolf managed to yell sanctuary as, as he approached the church, instead he goes into the church tower. Then he gets up there and like Venom in the Spider-Man movie, the the bells incapacitate him briefly, while Don Alfredo <laughs> makes it to the top with um, his silver bullet. And that's the end of the movie. He just, you know, he he he, you know, takes takes aim and fires, and and Oliver Reed flips over, mm-hmm. and um, and he's dead. We don't even see him switch back into Oliver Reed. He does. He doesn't, which is an interesting choice with this oh, movie yeah. versus other werewolf movies. Yeah, yeah, that's very strange. Um, and I wonder if he can. I wonder if he will. We just literally don't know. He might be changed forever by. Um, you know, by the curse. In other words, it might have, you know, it might have transformed him for all time. Um, and that's the end. And so what are we left with? Oliver Reed was cursed. F- so his mother had an unfortunate life and died. Oliver Reed grew up and I guess had a lot of joy in his life, but ultimately he was followed by this curse and he died. The woman who is in love with him is alone, uh, although she can hang out with Teresa who is sad because she's lost this adopted son of hers. She, she can go back to her original fiancé. Father had to shoot the son. Pepe, of course, has proved that that the wolf that he claimed to have killed 20 years ago is fraudulent. So, I mean, there's nobody wins in this picture, I guess except for Rico, who, <laughs> you know, can prove that he knew better all along. And I, yeah. <laughs> oh, and, and he'll be telling people. Yeah, no doubt about that. <laughs> Remember when I was right about that wolf? <laughs> Be the inconvenient woman. <laughs> you were daft, see? <laughs> oh, Rico. Oh, you can't really do that impression without the handkerchief. The yeah, that's you got to have the handkerchief moving and everything. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway... Uh, I, and, and we've gone through this movie fairly quickly, but I think it, it has a lot to do with the fact that the movie's very, very short, you know. And and um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good sort of overall arching, that's not even a phrase, some sort of thesis that fits the entire film, you know, that that, that fits it in the context of werewolf movies that we've seen so far. Because we, at, we saw... An American Werewolf in London. We saw the Wolfman. Here's the Curse of the Werewolf, and I think the next one we're going to watch is probably the American Wolfman. And you know, do you guys see any? It, how does this differ? Or I mean, what, what does this tell you about werewolves? I'm just trying to trying to make like, what is the purpose of this film, and, and why? Well, you know, the, the one thing this definitely has in common with the Wolfman is the, 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 essentially that out of the the pantheon of monsters. The werewolf is definitely the most pitiable of all yeah. creatures because it just, you know, it just sucks to be a werewolf. It, it keeps everything you want out of out of reach because you're. It's cursed. very much a curse. It is a curse. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Even even the beginning, it's opened with his eyes, with uh, tears in his eyes. Right, right. That was yeah. Tony was saying, you know, we open with a tear. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I guess that I guess that's right. You know, the 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 point is that it's a bummer. And to be honest, I felt probably worse for this werewolf than I have for any of the werewolves we've seen so, so far. Um, you know, I think I felt worse for this guy than I did for um, for Larry. Even though, you know, we we sure see Larry, you know, whining around a whole bunch of different movies. Um, well, Larry, so. like. I don't know, it's it's totally different, too. Like, Larry's circumstances are unfortunate, but there's kind of like, you know, even though it was a little bit of about fate, this guy's just had it. It's been bad from the get-go, man, you know? Yeah. And every yeah. time that he he uh, he gets a but break, every, you know? <laughs> yeah, every good thing really that's angled before him in the end is lost. And he's, you know, it, yeah, and he's, he's nightmares. Yeah, it's... 
it is a very very dark movie that that says. Do you think it's Do you think it's a cynical movie though? I don't think I don't, it's no, cynical. I don't think that. I think it's romantically pessimistic. I mean, uh, you know, and I think there's a difference. No, there's there's nothing sarcastic about this movie. It's more just just really really pessimistic that that things turn out badly for everyone. But because it's so beautiful, there, it's weird because it's like things turn out badly for everyone and it looks wonderful. You know, there, there's, a, there's still this tremendous sheen of beauty to this film. When you think about something like Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, which also has a similar thesis, wouldn't you think? And except for Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer is ugly and grainy and you feel, you feel dirty watching it. This doesn't feel like that at all, you know. There's a, a, it, so I don't know if that's because it also has a religious conviction about it that things well, this turn is out a, bad, that's God's plan. I don't know. This is not this is not only a not only a, a Hammer movie. This is a Terrence Fisher Hammer movie, and they, he certainly was the one that really hammered, no pun yeah. intended, home a lot of those religious. Things because unlike a lot of the other directors involved, he really, he really, he was a man of faith and he really believed. Huh. So you know, he wasn't, he wasn't cold selling. You know, this stuff. You know, there was definitely a conviction behind huh. it. And uh, yeah, um, that, no, that that tells me a lot. That that I never thought about that. Um, go ahead, Tony. I'm sorry. No, no, I, I didn't. Well, so th- there's something to that, this notion that you get a better horror movie, in a sense, well, depending on what you want horror to do, okay? But the idea that uh, what, what you were just said about Terrence Fisher suggests that you get a better horror movie when the person presenting the story has a finely honed uh, conviction of that there is such a thing as good and bad and curses, you know, God just sort of tipping the scales, and the, that happens for a reason, destiny. Whereas if you were a complete you know, non-believer in any of those things, you would have to work a lot harder to create what comes naturally to somebody who does. I don't know if that's actually I, – I, I know it works well for this movie. I have no idea if that works in general. Because, I, I, you know. I, think, I think it works well in gothic horror. I, I, you know, it doesn't necessarily – isn't necessary, I think, for all kinds of horror, but for this particular swimming pool of horror, this particular DNA strand of horror, this is this you know having a certain re- religiosity about it. Uh, yeah. I think really does help. Well, so let's let's flip it because yeah, when you look at gothic horror that doesn't have a really well understood sense of morality, the movie becomes kind of mushy. You know, you kind of fig- try to figure out, well, what is, you know, what is the point of this story? It is, it's more interesting when, when the vampires are beautiful and sexy and evil, and that's complicated, versus vampires in a gothic setting that exist in a, a modern, you know, uh, relativist world where there's nothing particularly evil about them. They're just different. And so it's not, you know, and once you take away the temptation of evil, then it's, you know, there's no conflict left. They're basically just people of an alternate race. And so now you're just doing a race relations picture. That's important and it's interesting, but surely you can make vampires about something besides that. Huh. Well, anyway, that, that certainly gets us to pretty much the end of the hour. We should do our, our final thoughts and then go to, uh, endorsements. Um, so we went, uh, we went, Julia, we'll do it in the same direction that we did before. Julia, Tony, Drew, and Jason. Julia, do you have, uh, any, uh, quick final thoughts and then we'll come around to endorsements? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I'll just say that, um, I think that there are some parts of the film that are good and I, I do think some of them, the relationshipy metaphor type of stuff was really interesting. Uh, I forgot, I forgot to mention, you know, I always try to bring, all these uh, relationships back to some kind of um, codependent relationship. Yes. <laughs> they always are. And I definitely think that's the case here with this, this woman at the end who's just, like, going to stand by her man through his his terrible uh, traumas, and she's, you know, she's, she's going to leave the stable guy for the totally messed up guy. 
<laughs> but anyway, that seems to be because you were talking about um, yeah, how our, right. our vampire movies about uh, um, what did you say it was? Uh, well, the attractiveness of evil. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just like, yeah, and they're also about. Uh, it seems like all these monster movies end up being about addiction and, and codependency. To me, anyway. Um, but uh, that's. But yeah, so I think there's some really interesting stuff about the whole pathos of you know the curse of the were of the werewolf and and how much how much pain he's in and the fact that it's not his fault. You know, he's just yeah. born this way. Um, so to quote Lady Gaga, um, but so that, so that's all I've, I've got, I think about that. I'm, I'm really glad you worked Lady Gaga into that. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, Tony, what are your final thoughts on the curse of the werewolf? Um, I really, you know, I enjoyed it much more than Julia, maybe not as much as Drew, but I still think, I think it's, it's cool. I think it's worth seeing. And even though, like I said before, the, uh, Makeup didn't totally work for me at the end. Um, it's definitely iconic and worth seeing, and there's a lot of really good stuff there. Although, <laughs> as an aside, I just when we were talking about the tear and stuff, I just now I want to know if there's somebody who's hardcore, who you know, like there's like the tear prison tattoo. Somebody needs to do that, but with tattooed werewolf makeup. <laughs> and so, so you're not hardcore unless you have the tear and the tattooed Curse of the Werewolf werewolf makeup that would really show how hardcore you are and I, I wonder if that exists somewhere hopefully now that i've said it i can find that somewhere because that would be something else like that and would I, really, and be... really really traditional prison tattoo look as well <laughs> that would just be crazy i, I don't that know how much makeup i mean sorry makeup <laughs> that much tattoo on your face I don't know. I mean, you still got to go to job interviews. What are you going to do? You know? Well, I don't know. I mean, I never people, stopped. People yeah. are usually that heavily tattooed at work in the tattoo industry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's my stopped, experience. Um, the Enigma, you know, <laughs> or the yeah. lizard guy who lives in town, too, you know. Or well, the Enigma The Enigma was actually in my apartment at one point. I was not there. Uh, he, he was over there hanging out with, uh, with Jamie. The Enigma being that. the guy with the uh, the the horns. Yeah, the puzzle puzzle pieces yeah, and yeah. all that. Yeah, if it was on yeah. the X Files. Yeah. He um, I, I, yeah, I, he's actually like I've had friends who who know him. It's pretty cool. Although he tries to be the persona. Like one time, <laughs> he came into with the music store that my wife used to work at, and he was trying to do the whole like I'm gonna riddle the what I need, oh, and God, the oh, store oh, workers oh. were just like, no, we're not gonna do that. Just tell me what you want. <laughs> like, <laughs> we get it. Like we get what you're trying to do, but that's not going to work here. You're not gonna. We're not going to help you. <laughs> I'm, so I make like, okay. seven fifty an hour. It's not worth it to deal with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and they're they're pretty nice there, but they didn't put up with any guff. And so his, you know, well, I, well, I think it's cool that he, you know, want to stay in character and such. They they were like enough ending, but we're we're. What do you need? What do you want? And we'll get you that. But you can't riddle me uh, your music selection that you need. <laughs> but, yeah, that that would be, you It'd know. It would be really funny if it were, like, terrible music that he was riddling to. You mm-hmm. know, if his, if his riddler, riddles were, you know, like, leading you to, I just called to say I love you, you know. <laughs> or, that would be awesome. That's a great like, song. I, you know, I don't know why you're I'm really, terrible, really looking for song. Tiffany, you know. Yeah, Tiffany, I would go with, but not. I just called to say I love you. It's a great. Song. It just popped into my head because of the <laughs> it rhymes Actually, with. I think we're a phone now. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> like the, the puns weren't even really good. Like the oh the riddles are really terrible. Like, oh. which evidently he's like pretty good at that. Like he's had a while to work on his persona. And like I said, I you know I've had friends who thought he was cool, but <laughs> it's just funny. Like, but that's what you, I mean, was, you know. You live in Austin and hang out with Jim Rose, I guess. That's what you do if you have a teardrop and a, and a Curse of the Werewolf werewolf makeup. Which I remember I'm that music store. That up. was over by uh, Vulcan, Vulcan Video, right? Yeah, Vulcan. Alpha Music. Yeah. That's right. Sweet. Um, I'm sorry. Now we've gone so far. <laughs> sorry. I derailed uh, it, but the imagery in my head had to had to see the light of day. Are we still on you, Tony? Was this your... <laughs> yes, like, this was like, my derailment. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Okay. Liked it better than Joya. Drew, <laughs> what are your final thoughts? <laughs> and where can you diverge us to? Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm like a straight arrow. I'm going to keep it all werewolf all the time. 
Uh, oh, oh, I by the way, really sorry. Um, uh, Netflix actually asked me, "Do you watch werewolf movies often?" And it's a little like you when you log in, and you want you to rate things. And I was like, "Yes, Netflix, I do, <laughs> especially lately." But I don't know. Sorry. I All thought right. that was pretty hilarious that it would ask me such a thing. It's been watching what you're watching. Go ahead, Drew. Uh, I really love this movie. Uh, I, I think we're going to not come across too many movies in this retrospective that I I don't at least enjoy on some level because I love werewolf movies. But this is this is a classic werewolf movie, and I think an important an important one in the evolution of cinematic lycanthropy. And, uh, yeah, great flick. Check it out. Wonderful, wonderful. You sound great like era. a scholar, cinematic lycanthropy. Yeah, cinematic uh, lycanthropy. Like, uh, you're, you're, you're up there with, with Adam with his, like, everything being a picture. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I like the use of the word picture. No, um, <laughs> but, uh, okay, so I, I have nothing else to add um, other than that, that I really admired this movie. I I have never seen it before and I thought it was a very enjoyable hammer picture for all the reasons we talked about. So that's one down, one about in the middle and, and two positives. I, I I did enjoy this movie. All right. So let's go around again for endorsements. Joya, I know you've been under the weather. I don't know if that's given you time to Survey the vast cultural field in front of you, and oh, well, of course, to I can't. This. I can't not. I can't not talk about the Doctor Who 50th anniversary special, the Day of the Doctor, which was just awesome. So anybody out there who's never, because I'm not actually a big Doctor Who fan. I've watched a handful of episodes. My daughter is way more into it than I am, but um, but I really enjoyed that special. It was a lot of fun. So if you have ever been interested in anything Doctor Who, definitely try to. See if you can get your hands on the uh, the day of the doctor because it'll kind of give you a neat introduction to the whole series. What? Wait, wait. Are really seriously? You feel like that would be an introduction to the series? If you haven't, if you if you love the series, then you'll love the thing. But no, here's you, my but question. But even though. if you don't know anything Let's about the series, you've never watched any Doctor Who. That's what I'm saying. I think Could you watch that movie? Yes, absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. I'm, no, no, I'm not. I'm not disagreeing with you per se. I'm just saying that that's a brave thing to say that you could watch that movie. And come out going, and and not be thoroughly bewildered by what the hell is going on. No, I think you could. Okay, I loved it. By the way, I thought it was wonderful. But it had so many in jokes, so many like asides that are meant to make you go, "Oh, dude, that's that line from that 1974 well, sure. episode. That's so funny." You know, things to laugh about. To I, I, I'm not trying to say this the wrong way. So but you're saying you're about. saying it's 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 basically fan porn. It is totally fan service. But I also think that if you have not watched the series, that you still get you still get a really good sense of it. And yes, it's fun, 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 that's right. Um, I mean, when they when they joke about you know like somebody will say a line and you know that that's a a wink to a line in some, and so how badass you are as a fan, you know, depends on how much you enjoy this movie. And also, Google did their most their their the biggest. Um, Google Doodle yet to date, they did this uh, game. It was like a, a, ver- a several le- level game for Doctor Who. It was really fun. Yeah, that's true. No, that was really awesome. And we spent, we managed to waste like just uh, w- w- like in the amount of time it takes to snap your fingers, we managed to waste 37 minutes playing this game because it times you. <laughs> and we're like, I'm like, how did 37 minutes just go by? <laughs> well, Sophie beat the game. Time travel. So, yeah. yeah. Ah, 18. <laughs> there we go. All right. Um, Tony, do you have any endorsements? Oh, I'm trying to think what, um, oh man, things have been just blending together pretty crazily lately. Um, geez, the one thing I have been watching, which I think has progressively gotten better, which doesn't happen a lot in a lot of series that I've watched lately. Um, yeah. I have been watching Once Upon a Time on Netflix and we started huh. and we'll catch up as they add them to Netflix. It started out kind of like, eh, I don't know, is this going to be any good? And they progressively add to the characters in a way that I'm constantly like, wow, you know, that's a pretty cool twist. Um, the CG person in me goes, I wish they had more money for compositing because it just drives me bonkers at 
the budget of like how things don't blend because they shoot a lot on green screens because it's yeah. cheaper that way. Um, but yeah, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff in this show um, that I didn't expect. I was extremely skeptical, and I think that they, while some of it seems to be, you know, kind of coincidental, I think that the way they add to characters and um, keep you kind of guessing as far as what people's motivations and then when they reveal things, like I think it works. Um, I haven't seen, of course, the new season, but um, catching up with it on Netflix, it's it's worth checking out. And, you, I mean, I preface that by saying I think you do have to kind of stick with it a little bit before it really becomes something where you're like, okay, I get it. Who's I got to guess who that guy is or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, I think – it, it definitely gets more and more layered, and it's it's actually pretty cool, worth checking out. So, very cool. Um, all right, wow, uh, Drew, do you have any endorsements for us? I do. I uh, I caught the uh, the Conjuring this week, and oh, yeah. I I uh-huh. completely no expectations for the movie, and I just thought it was terrific you know a great throwback to uh kind of the era like the, the late like the early to mid 70s you know amicus style horror flick and it's just a lot of fun very spooky very cool in fact it's it's really you know the fact that we've had colder weather and everything it's really had me jonesing for other spooky mm-hmm. horror flicks and you know i've rented a couple other movies trying to get similar movies and I'll be like, oh, well, if I go in with no expectations like this one, maybe I'll kind of find stumble across the gym. No. Right. Yeah. This, is, this is definitely a cut above a lot of what is uh, passed off as horror flicks lately. It's a cut above a lot. I mean, it is. Yeah. yeah. That and I was scary, surprised man. to learn it was from the guy that directed Saw because I, I am not a fan of Saw at all. But uh, I thought this was a very excellent movie, and it would actually make me interested in uh, what, what he does next. Yeah. Wow. That's a, that's a, that's a good one. And, and I liked the original Saw a lot, actually. But uh, I thought the original Saw would have been a great thirty-minute, like Alfred Hitchcock presents episode. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a no, bit you nailed it. It seems movie. like an episode of Alfred Hitchcock presents, or maybe the Night Gallery. You know, or it's a bit slim for a movie, though. It's a bit of a slim, and I don't know how they've gotten so many movies out of it because it doesn't even really have. Like right. with other kind of slasher movies, you at least have this this character to develop a kind of cult of personality around. But uh, you know, Saul doesn't even really have that. No, it becomes more like you know, like those movies where where death is chasing people. Final Destiny. It becomes like that, where you're just seeing you want to watch a lot of sort of interesting Rube Goldberg Rube Goldbergian you know uh, contraptions happen. You know, and with Saw, they usually also work in an ethical question. You know, like, can you kill a guy to get the key out of his stomach in time to unlock the thing that's going to kill you? You know, that that's interesting. I'm not interested particularly. I mean, I really, honestly, the the first one I loved. The the others I've like skimmed a few. I, I'm just not that interested. But um, okay, my uh, uh, my endorsement. I you know, I've only been I've been reading, and unfortunately, I've been I've been behind a little bit. So so just this past week. I finished reading um, uh, Carte Blanche, which was the new James Bond movie. It came out like like a year and a half ago, but it was really wonderful. I mean, and so I, so I have to mention it. Uh, Jeffrey Deaver wrote it, and uh, it's called Carte Blanche. And it you really said movie, but I assume you mean novel. Yes, the novel. What did I say? Movie. <laughs> did I? Oh my God! I'm so sorry. I like no. there's a movie of it. Okay. No, 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 no. It's a it's it's a novel. Uh, Carte Blanche. And what's amazing about it is that it's it reimagines James Bond, even though the Daniel Craig movies have have rebooted James Bond. The novels never did that until the book Carte Blanche, which reboots James Bond, but utterly differently from the way it got rebooted with the Daniel Craig movies. So in Carte Blanche, Bond is about 30 years old, and he is a, formal, a former naval, naval intelligence and then defense intelligence officer who's been recruited to be part of this top secret organization for the Ministry of Defense called the uh, called the ODG, which is just a, a sort of a meaningless thing. But all the double O agents are part of that. So he's not MI6, and in fact he has a rivalry with MI6. 
They're run by former executives of the MI6, but they're so deep undercover that MI6 is just this political bullshit outfit that, that they have to deal with, you know, because they have to, like, get information from them and trade info and stuff. It's a, it's a completely different um, New Bond universe, and I loved it. I, I really liked it a lot. I hope they do more, and I don't know if they will, because the next Bond book that just came out this past year goes back to the past. So I'm hoping that the next one that comes out next will continue the carte blanche universe, but we, we don't know. But, uh, you know, it was a hit, uh, I, and, and so I recommend carte blanche. Um, the only other thing, if, that, if it's okay for me to say this, this is log rolling, but Ben 10 number one came out this past week. So <clears throat> if you have uh, anyone in your life that's young enough to be into Ben 10, and, uh, you know, Christmas is coming up, pick up Ben 10. And, and Jason wrote it, so. Yes, I'm sorry, I should make that clear. <laughs> I'm the writer of Ben 10 for IDW. So issue one just came out this It's this getting week. awesome reviews. Yeah, issue two comes out in December, so uh, so get on the ground floor and get Ben 10 for, for a boy or girl that you love. Um, so, okay, gosh, I am loving this, uh, this retrospective. Uh, we will probably be back next week. I know we're going to take some time off for the Christmas holidays. We're probably also going to fit in a Christmas, uh, episode and, um, and God knows what's after the werewolf retrospective, but please like us on Facebook, tell your friends about uh, castle of horror, uh, continue to give us suggestions, questions, comments, complaints on the Facebook page and um, we've we've really enjoyed interacting interacting with everybody so um, uh, thanks everybody for being on and uh, I can't wait to talk to you guys again good night awesome. thanks guys good night, good night. Bye.